Hi, my name is Lee Steiner, and I'm going to dork out with you all today about forms. So, why are forms important? How many times a day do you fill in a form? <laughs> what, when was the last time you wrote an email, looked something up on Google, unlocked your phone? They're everywhere. But they're important, too. They're how we buy things. They're how we vote for presidents. Who remembers this disaster buckle? They're how we enshrine some of the most important decisions of our lives. According to one study, 41% of living wills, the forms that we fill out to make some of the most sensitive decisions about our end-of-life care, give directly conflicting instructions that don't, re don't reflect the desires of the people filling them out. Forms are an undeniable, unavoidable part of the internet today. You're going to make them, and a lot rides on you getting them right. So let's talk about when forms fail and how. There are three broad reasons why forms fail. First, there's a form you don't need. People hate forms. And when you ask people to fill them out, some portion of folks are always going to turn right around and leave your application rather than do it. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, is the trade-off worth it? Or two, your form is hard. The questions might be confusing or require information that your user doesn't have or would have to do research for. Um, or the layout itself might be confusing or frustrating. And third, the information being asked for is impertinent. Do you really want to give Candy Crush your social security number? <laughs> Why does this online service need my street address? Basically, who are these people and can they be trusted with my information? Forms succeed when you achieve this balance. The reward the user is chasing through completing your form weighed against the effort required to get there and always held in place by how much trust the user has in you and your process. Of course, as a developer, not a designer, why should you care? <laughs> So sometimes you are the designer. That's it. There's no one else. You're making these decisions. And having the slickest code won't make your app a success if nobody can get through the login process. And when you are working with the designer, you're often still going to have choices in how you realize a list of specs. And these choices can have far-ranging impacts on how someone experiences what you've built. And when you're working with a designer, there always will be snags in your implementation. Moments where the reality of the internet comes up against the lofty goals of the wireframes. And the better that you understand what makes an, inter, uh, an interaction usable, the better you will be able to guide the application towards solutions that work for the full stack in the fullest sense of the word, from your database to the human pushing buttons at the other end. Fortunately, forms are a lot like writing code. They are a way of asking for something very specific from a source whose inner workings you don't totally know. And so the first thing you should ask yourself is, who is your user? Um, who is using your forms, and when, and where? Are they digital natives? Are they people who use a computer once a month? Are you serving both populations? Because that's fun. Um, are they in a rush? Are they working in a quiet room? Are they on a mobile device? In short, do you have personas and user journeys? I hope so, and hopefully they're the same ones that you have for your application in general. And when you know who they are, what do you really need to ask them? If you're, not going to ask for, if you're not going to use the information, don't ask for it. And if it's not clear why and how you're going to use it, find a way to tell the user. What we can see here is uh, one version of the sign-up form for eBay, which asks for a telephone number. And it's not really very intuitive why an online auction site would want a phone number. And so you can see that there's a short explanation, which maybe you can't read. So it says, needed if there are questions about your order. Um, beside the input field to reassure the reader uh, that their time and effort is being respected. Generally speaking, if you can wait uh, to ask for a piece of information, it's better to ask later when your user has more buy-in. But most of all, dryness is not just for your code. Whatever you do decide to ask for, make sure that you only ever ask for it once. This is one place where developer needs and UX needs align very neatly. A call to the database might be slow, but it's not as expensive as losing a frustrated user altogether. And asking for the same information multiple times, especially things like phone numbers or street addresses, where there are different ways to correctly represent the same piece of information, can result in unpredictable and hard to clean variations in your data. Ultimately, this all comes down to the moment of your ask. To that end, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to run through some basic React implementations of a few different kinds of input fields and what kinds of problems they solve. So first, you have text boxes. They give your user the most freedom. When you, don't, when you know that you need a highly individualized answer, when the precise formatting isn't too important, and when you know that your users are motivated to complete your form, a text box 
gives you the highest potential for information. Clear open text fields are also the first thing that most users visually scan for when reading a form. And what's interesting to remember is that they will often jump straight to trying to fill them out before even reading any instructions you provide. Um, but they're not the only solution available to you, and they do have drawbacks. They require typing, which can be slow and inaccurate and will cause you problems on mobile devices. Um, and with all the complexity of that data, there comes the potential for messiness. At some point, some piece of code or even some human will have to make sense of all that text and decide what it means for the mechanics of your application. So a clean, simple counterpoint to a text box is a suite of radio buttons. They're great when you want a user to choose once and only once from a predetermined set. They're visually distinctive and will be recognizable and therefore easy for a lot of typical web users. They're also good for when you know that most people will have the same answer, which you can set as a default, and let everyone but the people who need to change that answer essentially skip that step. The drawback is that you have to think very carefully about your answers. How likely is someone to waffle between two, two options or to be frustrated that their real answer is, an, is one that you neglected to provide? Forms often try to work around this by including an other option that is combined with a text box, but then you have to have a way of dealing with that outlier data. They can also be visually overwhelming if you have more than a few options, making your form noisy and confusing. When your solution seems to be a lot of radio buttons, that's a sign that you should probably consider swapping them out for drop-down menus. Um, they have a lot of the same advantages and disadvantages of radio buttons, but can look a lot cleaner on a form when cons uh, conserving real estate is a priority. And when isn't that a priority on the web? It's important to put thought into the option that goes at the top of your menu, uh, and how the drop-down is organized. A long menu, longer than this one, uh, will be unwieldy, so if you need to provide a large number of options, such as, say, countries, but know that the bulk of your users will probably fall into two or three of those, you have an opportunity to streamline a lot of people's journeys by bringing those few options to the top ahead of a more conventional organizing system, such as alphabetical order. The last uh, style of input that I'm going to talk about today, although there are a few others, is the checkbox which has two main ways that it's commonly used. First, they exist in contrast to radio buttons and drop-downs as they allow users to check as many or as few options as may apply. This is a good compromise between the total openness of text boxes and the rigidity of radio buttons. Second, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this one, they are a common convention for opt-in, opt-out opt out moments. By rendering the default state as checked or unchecked, you can preload the option that you hope most of your users uh, will choose. While this can be implemented to prevent costly errors, it can also hugely erode the user's trust in your application by making them feel tricked into choosing something that they might not have otherwise chosen. To conclude, while implementing forms is a development task, it's one that can be made simpler and clearer when led and informed by considerations of your user. And what I've noticed over and over again is that the most effective techniques for increasing form completion, which is always going to be your ultimate goal, are often extremely simple pieces of code. So uh, if you're interested, here are a bunch of sources that I really used and enjoyed. And I would particularly recommend the top two, which are great books. Um, thank you so much for listening.